So there's quite a few things that I would like to speak about on today's show. Uh, it's something that uh, we can't help but but do. Um, we were going to do an entire show on the SAA match, the first ODI against Zimbabwe. But there's not really much to talk about in that particular match. So we might as well fill up this this particular episode with the breaking news that happened overnight. And we were going to, we're going to talk about Graham Smith. We're going to talk about what has happened, why he was um, found not guilty. Um, we're going to read the explainer from Click Info for Fidoz Munda put together a great explainer on why. We will we are going to read some of the main points of that on the show as well for you guys, so you guys can get an understanding of what has really gone down over here in this particular case. And then we'll get into the SAA talk and chat a little bit about SAA and let you guys know what happened over there. Um, if you're new to this channel, though, and if this is the first time that you're joining us, please subscribe to the channel. Please click that notification bell for all future videos. I know that a lot of people might not know that we are doing this particular show, so please go out there and tell everybody to come join if they want to find out what is really happening in the saga and what has taken place. There's a lot to get through, guys. Um, I'm going to try to get to it as quick as possible, but in a way that you guys still understand everything that has happened. Um, so I need to be very clear on that too. Um, so hopefully we can do that and and give you do do this justice as well because we want to get to know help you guys understand what has really happened and then we we'll maybe get into our opinion or my opinion on the incident. So what you also have to do now is subscribe to Cricket Fanatics magazine monthly. Every issue is one hundred percent free. Straight to your inbox every single month. The link is in the description. Let's get straight into today's episode, guys. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Cricket Fanatics Magazine. This is your daily show. I'm your host, Khalid Maiden. This is the show where we talk about all the major talking points in South African cricket. Now, this is the one show that we are actually going to be talking about what happened in cricket, a major talking point. Uh, something that broke overnight. Um, I was about to just take a nap and go in, uh, and go and sleep and, and put my head down and relax and when this news broke online. Um, so... We got the press release from Cricket South Africa and I tried to put it up immediately. Um, so what's actually happened with the Graham Smith situation? So I'm going to put it up on here on the screen for you guys to see. Um, this is what took place. Um, there's a lot that has happened because of, uh, Smith was obviously, this was obviously done by Fidos Munda. She put together the explainer of why he was racially cleared. Um, racially discriminatory conduct for cleared for that exactly. The arbiter, the arbitrators did find flaws in CSA Director of Cricket's decisions, but none that established race-based bias against him. Okay, so CSA has been CSA has cleared former Director of Cricket Graham Smith of all three charges of racial discriminate discriminatory behaviour, which come up for dis, which came up for discussion during the Social Justice Nation Building SJN reports tentative findings. Right, the SJN report didn't prove provi didn't provide definite conclusions, um, but flagged three incidences where Smith's conduct was p potentially prejudicial, and these were subsequently tested at the independent arbitrary arbitration last month. Now, after Smith has cleared on all counts, CSA is required to pay his legal costs. Here, we examine each of the issues considered by the arbitrators. So, I'm not going to read everyone in detail. But there was the Tami Solikili non-selection, which happened in 2012, where Tami Solikili obviously spoke about him not being selected um, in, that, in, in, in teams instead of where he should have been. He thought he should have been this, uh, the, the successor to Mark Poucher uh, as the test wicketkeeper. But in the end, um, they, they opted for Abe de Villiers um, before they took Quentin de Kock in 2014. And this was after Abe de Villiers spoke about his back hurting and he doesn't want to be a keeper while Mount Poucher was still keeper. And then after that, he said yes, and then um, to being keeper in that period where Sami Solikere could have been it. He thought his exclusion um, showed clear signs of system, systemic racism and pointed the finger at CSA with, 
with um, with Smith, who was obviously the main perpetrator of this. Now, of course, um, now they needed to every, obviously look at the situation. They heard evidence evidence from Solikili Smith, and who also provided written affidavits from former selection selectors um, and conveners Andrew Hudson as well as Linda Zondi. So Lekele testified that when he was contacted in 2012, Hudson told him he was unlikely to play against England or Australia that year, but could or would play in the home series against New Zealand in 2013. So Lekele claimed that Hudson gave him a guaranteed place, a guarantee of a place in the 11 in the New Zealand series. Hudson said he only told Solikele it was likely he would play. Uh, arbitrators found that after being uh, contracted, uh, Solikele had a reasonable expectation of being selected at the at the at least in the New Zealand series. However, the dynamics of the South Africa Test team changed when Boucher was injured ahead of the first test against England, prompting an early retirement. Solikele was not in the squad at the time. And De Villiers was the backup keeper. So Lekele was then called up to the squad as cover for De Villiers, but not as the replacement for Boucher. Um, so they go further to say that Hudson explained the selection decision to, to not pick Solikele, saying De Villiers gave the, the team the X factor and allowed us, the selectors, to select an extra bat at number seven. Smith concurred. Smith recalled then coach Gary Kirsten discussing the matter with him. As a result, Solikile did not play. In that instance, the arbitrators concluded that there is no direct evidence concerning the England tour that Mr. Smith actively influenced the selectors to exclude Mr. Solikile from the playing eleven. Now, from if you if you hear it from that perspective, there is no foul play. It doesn't sound like there's any foul play in that situation because there were multiple people discussing the reasons from a cricketing perspective at the time. So Lekele didn't get in an 11 on the tour of Australia that followed, and then the New Zealand series at home. Hudson explained, this was because the selection committee sought to retain the unquestionable momentum the team had created. Though Smith said he was not consulted about the selection for the New Zealand series, the arbitrators noted that the selection panel was instructed to have due regard to the views of the captain who is entitled to free, freely and strongly indicate his preferences in selection. And Smith was likely to have been consulted in the same way he had been for previous tours. CSA argued that Smith used his influence to exclude Solakili from selection, and one of the, the, the bases for his, this exclusion was Solakili's race. But the arbitrators found that even though Smith did influence the selectors and favored a strategy that left no room for Mr. Solakili, there was no evidence that uh, race played a role in the discussion and the decisions. The arbitrators therefore determined that it was a non race based reason, <laughs> or non race based reason. A uh, cricketing reason not to select Mr. Solakili, but said it was impossible not to be sympathetic to Solakili, who was never given the chance to prove his worth. So that was the occasion with Solakili. I mean, I did a whole show on this alone, on this whole thing, when it comes to Solakili. Um, I spoke about it in in depth, and I spoke about it when it actually happened. So I'm going to go through this, obviously, more in detail right now. Um, to give you guys an understanding um, of actually what's going down, it's been it's been a hectic couple of uh, a hectic night and hectic day, guys, because a lot of people were actually affected by this news in a diff in different ways, um, and it, it, it's not it's understandable that that is the case. Um, I'm going to move on now, and I'm going to go on to Boucher's appointment. Um, that was another thing that he was accused of, that he was showing favoritism towards Boucher over and Queen. So let's read what Vidos had to say in this particular article. Boucher was appointed head coach of the men's national team December 2019, shortly after Smith had accepted the DOC's role. Boucher displaced Enoch Nkwe, who was, who was acting team director, uh, the senior most member of the support staff. For South Africa's tour to India in 2019. Nkwe was named Boucher's assistant and served in the capacity until August last year before resigning. The arbitrators had to ask how and why Smith appointed Boucher and whether there was a direct or indirect discrimination against Nkwe in the process. They had to consider the suitability of Boucher and Nkwe for the po position as well as CSA's procedure uh, for appointing a national coach. 
The arbitration award noted that both Pouch and Queer were able coaches and differences lay in their experience and qualification and, ex and experience. I think she made a mistake there. Lay in their experience and qualifications and experience. Um, while Boucher had over a decade of international playing experience, and Queer had limited international uh, experience. He never played for South Africa, but held level four coaching certificate. Boucher did not. CSA did not have a consent, um, co uh, sorry, a consistent um, practice of requiring coaches to hold a level four certification, but had previously in advertisements called it advant advantageous. So that's new information that we didn't know. We thought. All of us actually thought that you needed a level four to be coached. That was one of the criteria. But obviously, that's not the case according to this particular article. Some previous coaches like Russell Dominguez had the qualification. Others like Kirsten did not. There was no job advertisement placed at the time for, for Boucher's, of Boucher's appointment. Now, that clears everything up for us because we were under the impression that that was part of the reason why it was unfair. But if it wasn't a major issue and it wasn't consistent in the past, then we shouldn't have an issue with that um, for this particular role. When it came to appointing the new national coach, Smith said while testifying that the 2019 World Cup, South Africa were the first team to be knocked out and returned the worst tournament performance in their history. And yeah, and there's, there's stuff that happened to me in, the, um, in this year as well. So it brings up back old memories. And the result of the India tour where they drew the T20I series 1-1 and lost the test 3-0. Had led to them to con uh, had led to him concluding that the team needed someone that had extensive, extensive experience in dealing with conditions, with the pressures that come with the international game. He did not conduct a formal process for a com com for a comparative evaluation between Boucher and Kwe. At the same time, Smith did not exactly um did not know exactly how long Mr. Nkwe had played domestic cricket or how long he had been a, a, a professional coach and had a, a month um, prior told CSA President Chris Nzani that he had identified Boucher as the main man to take the, the take over the role. In essence, Smith was not choosing between Boucher and Nkwe because the evidence suggested that he always preferred Mr. Nkwe for the position of assistant coach and Boucher for head coach as within the scope of his role as DOC. When Smith un was unveiled as the DOC, he met Boucher and Kwe to offer them the respective positions and appointed other staff, including Charles Langerfeld as bowling coach, Justin Antong as fielding coach, and Linda Zondi as governor of selectors. At the hearing, CSA criticized Smith's actions and said he would have made interim appointment, he should have made interim appointments first. Smith uh, countered by saying he had been given a directive to make a long-term appointment. That's weird that they would say he had to appoint interims first. That doesn't make any sense. The arbitrators found that the manner in which these appointments were made was clearly un un undesirable, as the jobs were never advertised and were certainly flaws in the way that Mark Boucher was appointed. But they, re but they reasoned but they reasoned they do not establish unfair racial discrimination by Mr. Smith against Mr. Nkwe. They found that Smith appointed the person he thought was best placed to coach the national team at the time. He honestly wanted the Proteus to succeed and honestly believed that Mr. Boucher was most likely to achieve that. We do not believe that he had evidence to suggest that he would have um, consciously appointed someone he thought was, was not the best person for the job um, because of their race. The arbit uh, arbitration award read. Yeah, okay, cool. So they, they basically cancel that out too. Working with the Black Sea CSA, CSA le leadership, um, perhaps the lightest of the charges was Smith was racially biased against Black leadership in CSA because of an allegation that was not willing to report to former CEO Tabang Moreau. The arbitrators found that CSA's arguments fell flat in light of Smith's willingness to report to the previous board, which had seven out of nine black directors. Subsequently, to the black interim board chair, Judge Zach Jakob, a newly appointed black board chair, Lawson Naidu, and, and to work alongside the black CEO, Poletsi Moseke. Moseke testified that Smith had worked well with all of the black leaders of CSA 
and that he had not seen and experienced any racial bias by Smith towards him or other members of black CSA management. Smith was in fact prepared to report to Monroe when he began as DOC, but Monroe was suspended at the time. Wow, hectic read, long read, a <clears throat> uh, lot to, to, to cover over there. And as you guys hear, he was obviously cleared of all charges. There was no way for them to be able to prove that um, there was any racism involved. And that's what they have, con have concluded. Then we put out an uh, article as well, guys, um, with Graham Smith. We gave a statement to everybody, which we're going to put up for you now. The main headline was, I'm grateful that my name has been finally cleared. So this is what <clears throat> Graham Smith had to say after everything had happened. I'm grateful that my name has finally been cleared. I've always given South African cricket my utmost as a player, captain, administrator of the last 20 years. So to hear these, these baseless allegations of racism being made has been extremely difficult for both me and my family. It has been exhausting and distracting, not least because South African cricket has also been going through a well-publicized rebuilding process, which has re required a lot of attention. I'm just pleased that we now have gone through a robust arbitration process before independent objective arbitrators, and I have been completely vindicated. So that's it, guys. That's it. And then he had his lawyer that obviously spoke, um, which is not, a, I don't think that's really necessarily important to go through. You guys can go on the site, cricketfanaticsmag.com, of course, to go see that. But ultimately, <clears throat> I'm glad that I stuck to my guns from the beginning and that I didn't get drawn in, or we didn't get drawn in. I think all of us didn't on this channel and, and part of this family. We didn't get drawn into the speculation. I maintained a strict, strict um, rule, and I'm going to remain sticking to that rule going forward. I will not um, say anything about anybody or accuse anybody of anything until until it's been proven or it's, it's been or it, or it's gone through a, a process because <clears throat> we've seen a lot of crazy things in this world where people have been accused of things that are not true and it, and it has destroyed their lives completely and this could have been an instance like that where someone has been falsely accused of racism now i'm going to continue with that going forward on this channel and i hope you guys respect that as that we will only talk about it when the facts come now, I'm going to start talking about the Tsolikile situation. <laughs> Unfortunately, and this is something that, that Dr. Musaji actually raised in his SJN hearing, there is, it's very difficult, it's very, very, very difficult to, 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 to prove someone is racist without clear-cut evidence of the person saying something directly. Or saying something, saying something racist to you. And what has happened is there might have been, they could, it's possible for there to be unconscious bias when it comes to people from certain race. And those are the type of things that we can't necessarily prove. But we might, as people of color, we might... Um, we might come across those type of things and we, and we don't understand why, you know? Like, for example, you might be treated differently and you don't know the reason why and someone else from a different color will be treated correct. So it's, it's crazy that it's, it's difficult to prove that. Now, with Bouch's case, he was accused of specific things said, you know, direct racism of racial slurs and things like that within a song. That he was accused of so i think it's a little bit more tricky to to obviously um explain that um and explain that away because it's actually evidence that he that the, there was obviously um, agreement that there was a song like that that was sung um and that's a totally different case to what this was so it's very difficult to prove that someone that 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 particular case was because of the race, and it wasn't about the cricketing ability. So <clears throat> it was 
those things do happen in cricket where there is a little bit of unconscious bias that I've witnessed myself as well. Um, just scoping around and looking around the country at certain unions, etc. There seems to be some sometimes in certain occasions in certain cricket fraternities in the country. And that doesn't necessarily mean domestic cricket, Division 1, Division 2. I'm talking about all around the country, school level, junior level, wherever the case may be. There, are, there is some sort of unconscious bias to build players of colour, and particularly black African players, cricket players, because they had a major, major, um, a major disadvantage when it comes to playing cricket in the country. They started years, 100 years after to actually play the sport fairly. So, yeah, that's the situation. So, Graham Smith has been cleared. We don't know. He's obviously, his contract is up as DOC. So, we don't know if they're going to approach him again for another position. Um, and those things will obviously reveal itself very soon. I think they'll probably go through the, the Mark Boucher situation first, clear that up first before they move on and decide what's going to be happening um, with regards to that. So let, let's see what happens um, going forward. Khalid, what's going to happen with people like um, Lawson Naidu now? I'm, I mean, surely it's must roll now. They basically bash Smith in the media without any facts. Um, <clears throat> Look, I don't actually think that they bashed him in the media necessarily. I think they needed to do what they needed to do based on the allegations made. And in, and generally speaking, with cases like this, you are guilty until proven innocent. I guess that is basically the, the notion that people kind of go with some, such sensitive topics. Um, because there's a lot of cases where there is racism involved that gets brushed under the carpet or people don't are scared to come up and speak about it. And that's what we saw at the SJN. There was a lot of players that might have felt racism towards them and they did not want to speak up or people in the industry that didn't want to speak about it because it's in the past and they want to leave it there and they don't want to maybe dig up old wounds, etc. Um, Tommy Solekiri decided to take it on. Um <clears throat> it obviously didn't help him the fact that he had all of those bands and and um, match fixing bands and all of these things behind him either. Um, but I think what got it so much attention, his story was because he went he went on Robert Marawa's show and that interview kind of blew up completely, and and I think that put a lot of um, spotlight on the whole issue and his story. So I think they were almost forced into making a decision. What I do respect them for is that they, yes, they could have easily said, you look here, you guys are suspended until you are proven innocent. And they didn't do that. So CSA has to get some sort of credit for actually allowing this to go through a process. Regardless of what they said and what they did, um, they, they went through a process and did not suspend them because of the allegations. Um, and these allegations, I think people are blaming it on the allegations on CSA. Like Lorenzo, I think you're saying yes, Smith can definitely open up a defamation case against CSA and will be hammered in court. But I don't think that it's CSA necessarily that CSA are not the ones that made the allegations. They created the issue in to clear up certain issues within South, South Africa. And Sami Solekile came forward. He could actually, what could happen is he could actually sue Sami Solekile for, for defamation because he's the one that made the accusations about him. CSA had to follow up when accusations as strongly as those are made. You can't just leave it and just say, oh, we're going to distrust Smith and what that he didn't do anything wrong. You have to go through the process. You can't just leave it. Imagine if it's like it's like if someone was racist to you um, and and it's going to be at, at, at your work and and you go to your to the and, the, and the and maybe the person that was racist to you is friends with the CEO and you go and you complain to HR. And they say, no, but, you know, um, I don't believe that the person would have said that. It's him. So I don't I doubt he would have said anything. And then the sweep it under the rug. You would be really pissed off about it. You wouldn't You wouldn't be okay with that happening. You would obviously be um, upset about that. So CSA had to do that. CSA had to go through the process and allow it to be investigated. They, I felt that they did the right thing in that regard to allow that to, to go through the process. And that's what I said at the beginning. 
You can't just expect them to just sweep it under the rug and just leave it. That was very strong allegations, regardless of who said it. But strong allegations. So they needed to do it in the right way. And I felt that they did it in the right way. They didn't suspend Smith, which they could have done. They didn't suspend Boucher, which they could have done. Um, they could have appointed an interim coach. They could have suspended Boucher. They could have suspended um, Graham until the yearning was over. But they didn't. So somewhat, they were kind of in his corner in a way, in that from that perspective, because they didn't um, just believe the allegations um, and put it out there. So it was always reported. And I think that's where we as fans need to be smart with the way we read and not be gullible with certain things and follow narratives online, etc., and go with the with the flow of what is said on Twitter. What should happen is we you should we should be very smart about the way we look at things. Consistently, reports were saying accused, accused, accused. It wasn't, and it wasn't. It wasn't necessarily guilty of. It was accused for. So it was never. None of the reports that I've read was per se actually said that Graham Smith was racist. There was accusations about him, and that he needed to be, it needed to go through the right process, especially because it happened through the SJN, where there were lawyers involved and legal things involved. They couldn't just work it out internally. They needed to, because of that process, they needed to go through the full process, and that was going to happen. And I think that we needed that in South Africa. We needed that process in South Africa. Um. So. That, that was something that needed to happen. Lauren saying true, but allow it to go through the process without any concrete proof, though. I'm just going by hearsay. No, so what happened was in that occasion is that was exactly what was the, what was going, what was the issue was about. It was supposed to be in a conversations about things that have taken place. Written affidavits, sworn affidavits, where people have sworn by oath that what the things that they are bringing forward is true. The evidence was an ex it's difficult because the evidence is an experience. How can you prove it? So, Lawrence, how would you have proven it in that age, day and age, um, in, in that era, 2012, in that era when Tamil Kili was a kid, a child, uh, facing the things that he said he faced? There was no way to prove those things. Um, there's no way that you can physically prove that he was racist to me. Like, it's very difficult to prove that. Like, I mean, how many times do people face prejudice? I mean, I'll tell you a funny story, and I'm not going to mention names and get people into trouble. But I just received. I, I I just went into a pharmacy. It was in a very in a very affluent area. I went into a pharmacy. I was extremely sick, um, and I needed to get medication. And I was wearing a mask. I was wearing a beanie. It was. I was cold. My chest was tight. I, I wore a hoodie. I was in like a in my in, my, in a, like a pajama pants, and I walked into the pharmacy, and everyone around the, not everybody but a lot of the people were looking at me funny, um, particularly white um, employers were looking at me funny, looking at me funny, and I was like, okay, like they gave me weird looks, and like and someone one of the one of the ladies came up to me and they're like, can I help you, sir? And I was like, no, I'm fine, thank you. And then they said, okay. And then they came back again afterwards, a five minutes later, asking me, are you sure we can't help you, sir? So I said, no, I'm fine. I'm just, look I'm just looking for what I'm looking for. I need to look have a look over here at all the products. I want to see which one I want to buy. Okay. But they never took their eyes off me. And I went to the thing. And when I went to the counter and I gave it, and they, I gave my medical aid, her whole face changed when she dealt with me afterwards. And I was like, what the hell was that? <laughs> and I walked out and I never went to that pharmacy again because I felt, I was like, what has happened? Like, I could feel it. It was weird. And, and at that point, I wasn't as aware to these type of things because I never faced it necessarily at that particular, at that particular time in my life. I never actually faced racism blatantly. There were things that happened that I wasn't 100% sure of that you, you, sometimes you, you, you frown and you're like, wait, that was weird. Um, how come that person's getting something over me, but we on the same level? I'm better, and this person's getting certain, um, certain. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you're looking getting certain advantages because of it. So there, there are some things that go through. So it's very difficult for Thomas Olekiri. 
if it was anybody else to come in and say, oh, no, you know, he was racist to me. And then even if he does say, this is what he told said to me, there was no recording. You're not going, when someone's racist, it's normally out of, out of, I don't know, anger and spur of the moment. You don't expect it. So it's not like you're going to be walking around with a, with a phone recorder in your, in your pocket, like Amber Heard, and wait for someone to, um, to and record everything and then say like, hey, uh, I want, and try to trick the person into saying something or doing something that's racist. So the issue in hearings was about experiences and things that they've witnessed in their life. And the reason why it happened is because it wasn't the only person that said something, that said they faced something like that. It was obviously more than one case that pointed towards it um, throughout the issue in. So they had to go through the process, which I think they did correctly. At least Smithy won now so we can keep his head high and move on. Tommy is what it is because Tommy's band didn't help much. It's almost impossible to prove that, to be honest. Exactly. Um, exactly. It's almost impossible to prove that exactly. Um, so even though you feel a certain, and, and, and it's going to be based on a feeling of a certain way, um, you're going to feel a certain way or feel uncomfortable. That feeling, you, you won't understand until you experience it. That feeling is, is not a nice feeling to have. Um, and you're like this, there's, there's so many occasions. I, I was at varsity once, um, and a girl walked, no, actually, sorry. I was at school, um, junior school and, a, and one of my friends or one of my, my classmates, she came into the classroom and she started, she just fell apart and started crying. And I asked her what is wrong. And she was actually adopted. She had two white, she had two white parents. Um, she was adopted. She was a black African girl um, and she came in there and she started ch crying and we asked her like, what is going on? What is around? Is everything okay? And then she, she eventually got it out to the teacher and the teacher told us that um, with her permission, of course, because she couldn't really speak about it. She was young. I mean, we were, we were very young at the time. I mean, we must've been like 11, 12 years old and we were all youngsters, but not understanding what's going on. And they said, no, she was called bad names when they were, she was at Cavendish and a lady called her a bad name in the line, telling her she's blocking the line at Cavendish for the, to go to the tickets. Um, and she doesn't even drive and she called her a bad name. And she didn't think that the parents were in front. She called her the K word. And she didn't know that the people, that the parents were in front and the parents heard her and turned around and it was a massive thing. And I think they were almost going to actually sue the lady, but they just let it go after a while. So... Things like that happen in South Africa and we just don't know about it and we just brush it over, uh, brush it under the carpet and we forget about it, you know. And I don't think that that, and I think that's a good step that the SJA indeed is they allowed people to tell their stories. Whether the stories were true, whether the stories weren't true, um, that's up to that person that's lying under oath because why are you lying under oath? You shouldn't be. Um, but if you do, then you must um, obviously face the repercussions of that. So, what I think happened over here in this situation is there was no way for CSA to, or the arbitrators to prove that Graham Smith was racist in these occasions, in those cases. There was no way of proving it. Whether he was or whether he wasn't, he would only know. But we need to take this situation as it is. We can't still be running with that bias. I feel that we need to understand that, look here, he was proven guilty. I mean, he was proven innocent, sorry. So we have to go with that. That was what came out of the issue in. in. And if you can't trust the system, then we're never going to come right. So in this, in this particular instance, the system worked in Graham Smith's favor and he came through. And we need to respect that and we need to move on from it. So, yeah, I'm glad that it was cleared because that's a hero of South African cricket. We didn't really want to see that happen to someone that is that was a former captain that was so well respected in South African cricket. If he was proven guilty, wow, guys, it would have been heartbreaking. I mean, even if it was, he was guilty, it would have still been heartbreaking for fans, for a guy that we've always looked up to. Okay, let's move on to this SAA game. Um, let's explain what happened there. Gee, it was, guys, I covered the game, watched the game. Wasn't happy, guys. I'm gonna not gonna lie. I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy with what I saw um, by our batters specifically. Um, I wasn't happy with the way 
we we I was happy with the way we started off. I thought that Tony Dezorzi and Tiana Sabrain, we've got Werner with us. Um I was happy with Tiana Sabrain, Tony Dezorzi. Um, the way they started off, you know, getting that first 57 runs. It was a it was a decent partnership. Got a couple of luck here and there. Um, but the dismissals, ooh, like Tiana Sabrain's dismissal was 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 weak. I didn't expect him to to go out in that manner, just jabbing at the delivery and then nicking off. Um, he was looking good, so I was a bit disappointed by the by the batting. Um, although we have to give credit where it's due, and Andy Klaassen and Andile Pechelkwai batted excellently in the middle overs. Um, Andile was pretty impressive, 87 runs, um, of 91 deliveries, I think it was. Werner, if you have it in front of you, um, no, I think it was 92. 92 with deliveries, okay. Um, and, and a class, and I can't remember how family deliveries it was, but yeah, you got a 57, I think it is. And um, uh, and delay 87 of 93, class in 58 of 51. 58 to 51, cool. That was the scores. I don't have it in front of me, guys, so bear with me. Um, Werner's gonna look at the scorecard, but um, that was the in that was the partnership that saved the game ultimately. and what that we wanted we didn't see um ultimately Werner. we wanted our a lot of the the newer guys to get opportunities and i was like puzzled by why vian liber got to, was put into the squad in the beginning of the match when he wasn't in the squad initially and then also they bat him at the position in the odis as well and they played everybody ahead of him which was even in delay so it was a bit weird that part of it um but at least we could get a basic understanding of what the picking order is in a way. I mean, seeing Bjorn Fortein get selected, seeing that um, Lazard Williams was selected, seeing that the likes of Tiana Zabrain got an opportunity. I'm happy about that based on what he's formed recently. Um, I like the fact that um, Vian Liver was in the squad and unfortunately he didn't perform the way we wanted him to perform. But the batting was so bad, Werner. What what are what's your what's your thoughts on it? But um from what you got to watch or at least what you witnessed. Yeah, the batting was pretty poor. It it seemed to lack intent a lot of the time. Um it felt it felt like we were bat- playing old school ODI cricket, like batting at three and a half, four and over, not really getting anywhere and then throwing our wickets away. Um we only really saw intent. What in the second half of like class and and, and Bechlequio's partnership, that's the only time we really started to see some proper attacking intent, trying to put the bowlers under pressure. So yeah, it, it was a bit weird. The whole batting lineup, the line, the the order of the batting lineup is is strange to me. Uh, when you have Lebo, why not bat him up the order? Um, Dennis the Brain, most of his career has batted at three or four. Yes, he's opened for the Titans like this season, but. Reza Hendrix has, it's, 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 it's a kind of a weird sort of lineup for me. It's like, we have a lot of top order batters, but they like spread out throughout the middle order. Um, it, it just, the whole team didn't seem very balanced, but I didn't now afterwards, I saw there were some COVID cases. Um, some of the bowlers. Oh, I didn't know that. To... Oh, so, so let me, let me quickly get you that article and then you can you can talk on and i'll quickly okay. get, get that um report article. okay cool okay cool awesome yeah because i mean what i would like to see is obviously the sa team being the second best team and then obviously understanding oh this is the guy that's going to probably be the backup for xyz you know like you'll know that your openers are quinny and if it's quinny and, and, and yanaman then you know that your backup opener will either be um Tiennes De Brain or Tony De Zorzi. I was hoping that they were looking at Tony De Zorzi in that number four slot, number f- number four or five slot for South Africa um, going forward um, in, 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 in one day the Nationals. I like him at four, although he bats, he does bat open, he, he's an opener for Western Province Blitz and he also does sometimes bat at three for VP Blitz. They move him around a bit dependable on who's available at the top of the order because sometimes John Bird wasn't available and John is normally the opener and they normally used to have like Daniel Smith open if he's not keeping. So it's, it's, uh, it's up and down. And now Eddie Moore has moved to Western Province Blitz. So he'll probably open the batting in all formats. Um, I don't know about T20s, but at least in, a, in one days. And, and and so obviously then Tony's probably going to move down one, I feel, because Jono is the opener um, they've, that they've classed as an opener. Now we did see Jono bat lower down in 
D20s, um, number four, I think it was, he batted in D20s. But I think that Tony could possibly be that number uh, number four, five batter internationally. That's where I would like to probably see. Um, did you find the article, though? I did. So yeah. this only came out after the match, which is a bit late, but it says yeah. there are some team updates. Luther Sopamla has returned home to South Africa due to an aggravation of his left hamstring injury, uh, which was recovering well from... Uh, he was recovering well from after incurring in a Pratia's test series against Bangladesh earlier this month. Glenton Stearman has been called up to replace him. Then Ryan Rickleton was released from isolation this morning. He apparently had COVID up till now, but he is has been released from isolation. He should be fine for the, the next game. Uh, so Brian tested positive for COVID oh, and before wow. the team's departure. So that's the reason Vian Leber came into the one-day um, squad. Uh, so I'm I'm there's thinking always... the reason the re yes yeah, <laughs> way too late. But, a reason. <laughs> yeah, there there is a reason, but we only get to hear it afterwards. So After everybody needs to specu speculate. The whole the whole game's complete already, and now they bring it out. I see the. Uh, I see it here now in my in my email, but I didn't check my email. I thought after the game's done, you know, it's it's done. I see the yeah. media release here that I haven't released. Um, I yeah, haven't put it's, out there. It's, it's too late. It's, yeah, anyway. It, <laughs> yeah, it's it's too late, and I I guess that's probably the reason why Leber came in so late. He was probably like yeah. a, a like for like replacement for Sir Brian. So they were going to bat Sir Brian at seven or eight. They already had their lineup in mind, and then decided okay, they'll just slot Leber in there as like the offy that will bat as well, and like didn't try to to change the the lineup too much. So we'll see if that that changes in the next match. Um, but so that's also the reason why Ryan Rickleton. Um, didn't play, and then I heard somewhere along the line that Darren de Pavillon was also not available to be picked for this match, or so maybe he will get a game next one. Ho hopefully, the the balance will be better as as the matches goes on. But yeah, so this came a bit later. We all were left to speculate why things looked a bit wonky. Yeah, and I mean, I would have probably even looked at my email again <laughs> today, so <laughs> I would have missed this press release. And I didn't look at my phone either because I mean. When this was released, it was right around time. I was actually cooking at the time, um, preparing food. So for tonight, obviously, to break my fast, etc. So I was I didn't get to see that. That's why probably I'm a, that's why I missed it actually. Um, so I wasn't obviously looking at my phone. I don't look at my phone between the time I break my fast and about an hour and a half after. So I, half an hour before the show, I kind of wind into this again, go do my research, go to check, just make sure that everything's okay, you know, um, that everything is sorted out before the show. Um, yeah. because the Smith stuff, I was going to do a show tomorrow on Smith alone, um, and do a whole show on it. But I thought, you know what, by that time, everybody would have already went through everything. Um, they can rather go through our video and watch our video tomorrow and find out what actually happened uh, instead of, um, like me doing a show on it tomorrow. So we've cleared that out. We've cleared the SAA things out of the, out of the way. South Africa lost the match, by the way, guys, if you guys don't know, um, bad light in the final over, uh, unfortunately, or just before the final over. Um, and yeah, unfortunately they lost on DLS, um, by five runs and yeah, so they lost the first one day and I feel because they didn't put enough on the board as simple as that. They didn't bat well enough. I feel, I mean, the bowling, what the, the bowling wickets happened in, 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 in cluster, not in clusters, but in, 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 um, in gaps, basically in stages. That's what I wanted to say. Um, it wasn't necessarily, uh, a massive collapse by Zimbabwe because they kind of recovered every single time. So they lost their first wicket. I mean, the first over, a beautiful delivery by Zad Williams, by the way. My Lord, look at that first wicket. I was just like, my word, a beautiful delivery. And then they lost their second wicket at with 55 on the board, then 106, then 142, then 213. So they, they, they kept on adding runs to the board on the board and then lost the wicket it wasn't like south africa that lost a couple in a, in a in a short succession so in quick succession so what is your thoughts on the on the match as a whole Vernon? let this wrap up the show um where do you think we can improve um the guys that were missing i think they would have probably played yeah they probably would have there, there would have been a, a couple of changes to the side maybe the batting order as well um, but lots of lots to improve on, especially the batting. They need to rotate the strike better. We can't just get stuck on one end the whole time. Um, need to get a couple of big shots out as well. We we can't play. You can't play that old-fashioned 
cricket anymore. We need to to be up with the times, really. Um, and in the bowling, we didn't look all too threatening, really. We didn't look like we had a bunch of wicket takers out there. We the game sort of just drifted on in in Zimbabwe's favour. Here and there, we got a wicket, but not too many times that we really built up the pressure. I thought I mean, Gerald Kutia was pretty good today. I enjoyed him. Uh, he rushed the batters. He was the one guy that that looked like he might pick up a wicket at any stage. Um, so that was good to see. Glad to see him again in in SA colours. The last time was at SA under nineteen level. So it's it's good to see him there, um, running in hard, giving it everything he's got. Uh, him and Lazard Williams were probably the best. Tain was pretty tidy, but again, not all that threatening. Um, I I would have loved to see a leg spinner in this lineup. Uh, I don't know who they would play, Janai Dawood or 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 Sean von Berg, Berg or or who, whoever it might be. I would just love a, a leggy um, in this lineup. Um, but uh, but overall, it, it didn't look too threatening. So they they'll need to um, put on some more pressure in the next match, whether we bat first or both. So if we bat first, we need to put on some bigger scores. Um, yeah form some big partnerships good to see on scoring that 87 i i enjoyed that um it's good to see him kicking on with the bat but he needs to come to the party with the ball as well um mm. he can't now that his batting is finally starting <laughs> to to hit form now he's bowling to go down will no, we thought oh, i mean i speculated that that might happen because the focus would probably be on i can see that the focus has been on his batting you can like you can see it because like what has happened in recent times even domestically eating hundreds his first hundreds over there as well and then coming international cricket and also performing with a bat the problem i have with him and with his batting that's something that he must maybe work out of his game it's almost like he goes for a big shot every every delivery like he's always trying a difficult cut shot or he's trying a massive drive or he's trying a massive sweep or massive pull shot shot or a massive reverse sweep or something. It's always big shots that he's playing. And I think that might be his, his downfall if he wants to be a real true batter. I think he needs to work on a game that he can kick, hit the ball in the gaps. He needs to find a way that he can rotate strike. I think that will help him to get his eye in because he's really talented. He has some shots. The guy is talented. He has an eye. I mean... We, legendary coaches and former players wouldn't have cast him up as much in his younger days, particularly also because of his batting ability, actually, not his bowling ability. That's the weird thing about it. That a lot of people cast him up because of his, they're saying that he was going to be the next all round of South Africa that can actually bat. And we saw sporadic innings of his where he could really smash. I'll never forget that innings with him and David Miller. I mean, him and Andy Klassen and him and David Miller uh, when they played against India in the in the in the pink um ODI Johannesburg, the only one they won on that tour. And he was really excellent in that match. Um but I think that's something that he needs to work on because I feel that he plays way too many big shots when he's at the crease. I think he needs to also slow things down a little bit, play some some simple shots, knock the ball into the gaps and, and run between the wickets. Yeah, it, it it almost feels like Andy and and Diervold can go to the same coach <laughs> just to learn a bit of a touch game, strike rotation, not not necessary to hit every ball out of the stadium, so they can both go for the same like lesson. <laughs> you're lucky you're saying this year, not putting that as a tweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'd, I'd rather not go that route. Apparently, my tweets are getting some more traction these days, so I need to be careful what I what I'm saying over there. <laughs> yeah, of course, man. Okay, Andy Klassen, good performance. Would have hoped he really scored 100. Um, that's what I expect from him. When he, I know it's a bit maybe harsh, but I expect this man to come out there and smack 100 against Zimbabwe for SAA. I mean, yeah, we expect looked, him to do that for the protest. He looks he very good. good. He's, he's definitely found his form again this season. You could see it for mm. the Titans, and you could see it today. He's definitely back to the old Heinrich Klassen, so we just need him to, to really kick on. But I think at the back end, they're... Pechlequayo took most of the strike, so he ended yeah. up not facing a lot of balls at the end there. And when he did go for the big <laughs> yeah. shot, he got out. Uh, so he probably wouldn't have gotten to a hundred in any case. But yeah, decent, decent, fifty-eight or fifty-one, I think I said. Yeah. So he looked, he looked good. I think Tienes the brain really needs to take his opportunity here because he's been in excellent form for the Titans as well. So if he's getting that opportunity to open, he's the one that needs to score some big hundreds. Uh, Lorenzo saying, Carly, do you, uh, if Zondo fails on this tour, do they select? I don't even think Zondo should have been picked in the first place, to be honest. <laughs> where, <laughs> like where, is Sips, where is Sips Yeah, 
I think Sib should have been selected in this over 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 Zondo. That's my honest opinion. Uh, I don't have anything against Zondo. Don't uh, Zondo, please don't call me to the issue and and say something because I I can't be racist to you. Of course, I'm just joking. Uh, but like from this perspective, I'm talking about Z Zondo's performance this season. Um, he's been he's been pretty good. He has been good for the Dolphins this season. He has been in form in you know, in certain occasions. But I do think, mostly but not in, in the, the one day format. Yes, yeah. not, mostly in the longer format. So, mo so when it comes to the one day, is subs not there is weird for me because I think he should have been selected. I don't know if they, if they. So I think we can now safely conclude that Victor and the selectors are, are rewarding longevity within the domestic game. It seems to be the case. They're starting to select people that might have been ousted before and giving them opportunities again that have been playing for a long time in the domestic arena. It does seem that like those guys, if they do put on the runs, if they do put on some sort of runs, they are getting preference over the, the newer guys that are performing. It seems to be the case in this occasion because there was no racial motivation, I feel, with Zondo's selection in this case because you have another, you have a couple of black African players and colored players that have been performing at the at domestic level that could have been selected in his place. So I don't know. So that was maybe just a, a poor selection. From I feel from that perspective, um, uh, because I I really feel outdone by for subs, especially been batting the way he did as a captain for the Titans, a lot of pressure. Yeah. Okay, yeah, guys. He's looked, he's looked Final great. words I've from enjoyed. you, Yeah, no, I've I've enjoyed Sub Makanya this season. I think it's been a great move for him to go up to the Titans, and he's been given that responsibility to captain the one day cup, the one day side. Um, I think it's done him the world of good. He's taken a lot of responsibility with the bat, and he's been striking it at a good strike rate as well. He's been he's been going really well. So I think he is unfortunate to miss out, but hopefully he has another season like this, and then he will get his call up. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, thanks a lot for tuning in. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to smash the like button, comment, share, subscribe, click that notification bell for all future videos. Don't forget to download the latest issue of Cricket Fanatics magazine monthly. Every issue is 100% free, straight to your inbox every single month. The link is on the screen as well as in the description. Also become a patron today. We're growing, guys. We're getting better. I have to say a shout out. I have to say a shout out to our latest um, patron. I, I want to say a special message to him as well um, because he uh, he's come. He was one of our latest pa uh, patrons um, and I have to obviously give Everybody that is the latest, they have to get a, a shout out. Um, one is due over here. Anderson's got to my shout out to make sure. So thank you, Devin, um, for becoming a patron. And uh, shout out to you. Um, you get a shout out on the show, on the podcast. The, whatever podcast is the closest to when you subscribe, you get a shout out on the show. So thank you, Devin, for that. If you want to become a patron. Congratulations on your wedding, that Devin. <laughs> anyway, um, that's the other Devin. <laughs> Kick off the Click on the link on the screen as well as in the description. Go to cricketfanaticsbag.com for all updates. Everything that you need to know about the Smith thing is there. Um, and obviously, go to uh, go to Crick Info for the explanation um, from from um, from Fidos. Cool, guys. Thanks a lot for watching. And I'll see you guys again tomorrow with another daily show. Um, I think... I'm thinking of doing part two. Uh, Werner, if you are available. Otherwise, I'll wait for you because I need you for the part two of our discussion of each um, position and explaining like, yeah, we're going into the all-rounders and we're going into the bowlers. So when you are free, let me know. You can DM me and, um, yeah, we can discuss it. Um, but, guys, thanks a lot for tuning in. We'll see you guys again tomorrow with the Daily Show. Take care, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your evening and the rest of your week. Peace.